I've been thinking about this quite a lot, and I've become increasingly taken by the dance of biology, demography, economy, and sociology. I see four things that are particularly interesting and, and captivating to me. First, I believe there will be more and more and more longevity. Some of your children will live to be 150. A few of them will live to be 200. They are already born. That is the future. The question is whether longevity will be available for everyone or for people who are willing to get on a plane and go get it somewhere that it's offered or have the money to buy it. And if it's to have the money to buy it, then we're in a whole new ball game of 99-1. I would also tell you that I am captivated by the intellectual gravitational field that's rising up out of Silicon Valley having to do with the future of health. These people have a different thought process. The Elon Musk, the Peter Diamandis, the Ray Kurzweil's, the Craig Venters, they don't think in terms of linear growth because they've grown up in the era of Moore's Law which is that about every 12 to 18 months, technological power doubles and becomes half as expensive. So you're dealing with an exponential capability due to computational technological evolution. So if I take three steps, linear, 30 steps linearly, I would get across this room. That's 30 linear steps. Most of us think of progress in a linear way. We'll do a little bit more this year. Washington will do a little bit more or less next year. But if I were to take 30 exponential steps, that would take me 25 times around the Earth. So when Google launches Calico, which is designed to beat aging, and they've got unlimited funds, essentially, they're not fooling around. When Craig Venter last week announces the emergence of a new company, Longevity Inc., he's not fooling around. He's the man that decoded DNA. But one of the questions is going to be, what if we're unruly or make mistakes in our pursuit of longevity. By the way, I think we're in the middle of that right now. We've created longer and longer life with enormously horrific diseases in the last 5, 10, 20 years. What if, for example, we can beat cancer? What if heart disease becomes a thing of the past, but we have no technological or scientific breakthrough with regard to Alzheimer's disease, which has a 47% rate over the age of 85? We will then be creating a world of 120, 150-year-olds who will be demented for 60 or 70 years. These kinds of horrors are part of the imagination of the future of longevity that requires wise navigation. The challenge, how do we match our health span to our lifespan, to live fully through our years with the least amount of suffering and pain? And you know what else? The future of longevity will also probably have a consideration of the future of the end of life. As more and more people say, under these terms, I'd like to keep going. Under those terms and conditions, not for me. Second, I believe that, and this is a little bit of a downer one, that I think we're heading to some economic misalignment. Um, unfortunately, our parents who grew up in a period of uh, shadow of the Depression were quite frugal about their dollars, saved very thoughtfully and to their good credit, were part of a very small generation. So that was an easy generation to support. The boomers grew up in a period of great prosperity. We've been excessively debt-oriented. A third of the boomers have less than $1,000 in their total lifetime savings. And uh, we just don't have it baked into our DNA to be thoughtful about having money over a long life. And I would challenge this organization and this field how can we not have financial empowerment and financial literacy, one of the major legs of the stool of the future of aging? It's not a part of our discussion. It has to be. I'm concerned that it's not just entitlements that will be strained as a result of changing demographics, but also because of the fact that beginning in the 1970s, we switched guaranteed pensions for the masses and turned them into 401ks and put the responsibility on individuals, most of whom are not exercising that responsibility very effectively. Is it conceivable that a third of this next generation will be impoverished, as was the case 100 years before? And this will be a big generation. So will that be more work? Will that be more interdependencies and families? Will it be more charity? And I would tell you, watch for innovations in capitalism, because there are a lot of people with a lot of money who actually have big hearts. Keep an eye out for what is going to be called social impact bonds. There are billions of dollars trying to find their way to the aging problems of the 21st century. Third, I think we're going to build a purpose for maturity. There was a purpose back in colonial times when their elders were few and they commanded the family. 
We have not created a purpose for older adults in this modern age yet. Last year, the average retiree watched 49 hours of television a week. And I think that's a mistake. There's an African saying that when an old one dies, it's like a library burning down. We have millions of libraries burning down every day in this world, and it's our fault for not being more creative about thinking about the role of a long-lived population. I'm taken by encore careers. I'm taken by philanthropeneuring. I'm taken by a new era of volunteering at people's highest levels, mentoring, and yes, even people with resources helping to support family members, which has always been the case, and in times of need, we'll do it again. I think we're heading for a time of contribution in the family, in the community, and in the nation, in the world. I was intrigued a few years ago when Desmond Tutu and Nelson Mandela, who I would say as a footnote was the most extraordinary human being I've ever, I'd ever met, um, when Nelson Mandela and Desmond Tutu and, uh, and Jimmy Carter and a few other of the elders became the elders. We need more of that. We need tribes of elders to lead us again, not just to watch a lot of TV and receive entitlement benefits. Fourth and last, I believe that, oh, by the way, I would add to those last two, that one of the big obstacles is that we've got a particularly unpleasant era of political knuckleheadedness. Uh, I, it's just, it, it's just, I, I, I have to tell you, I can't even understand how ridiculous most of what goes on in that city is in this time of enormous challenge and opportunity. And last, I think our field is going to blossom and grow in fantastic new ways. It's going to engage technology. It's going to think of new solutions. It's going to become more geriactive in, in, in supporting the life sciences so that we can knock out some of these diseases. It will inspire people in the world of media and marketing and social media to be more considerate of older adults and more inclusive of the intergenerationality of our world. I think housing, transportation, public service, police officers, mail carriers, Millions and millions of people throughout this country and this world will wake up each day and think about how do I do a better job of helping people live long, full, contributory lives with safety and security with a special concern for protecting the vulnerable.